Welcome back to another Supercoach video with me, JD. Apologies for this week's video being a little bit later than usual, but uh, of course it means that we've seen teams lists, well, for at least one game which we'll go through. We've seen some uh, injury updates and all that good stuff, so hopefully it can give a little bit of better trade advice. But before we jump into that, we'll go through the week that was. So a 21-3-8 for me, which is well and truly the best week of the year so far for me and maybe somewhat surprisingly because this is the buy that many people were questioning me about i had dacos grundy jordan roberts heaney are you worried about this buy and i said not really you know with the coverage across lines you likely trade one or two of them and yeah it turns out it's worked out all right i mean obviously a lot of things had to go in my favor to have a week this good placing me in the what top 400 for the week but uh, yeah, it just goes to show that you can you can plan around these buys and take some of the players as long as the value's there and the price is right. So um, moved up into 1300 overall for the year, which is, yeah, pretty good um, striking point. And then most importantly, the team value there at 12.3 mil. Um, once again, question the Discord uh, this week for where everyone's team uh, value is at. I feel like um, anywhere between 12 to 12.3 was very common, and that's totaling up not only your team value, but then your cash in bank as well. Uh, that Anything around that 12 to 12.3 mark is good. I think anything above 12.4 at the moment, you're doing exceptionally well. You're in the top handful of coaches, and anything below 12 mil, you may struggle a little bit. You've probably got some dead rookies on bench, I'm guessing, or maybe some more of the underperforming premiums, and you might need to seek value to finish your team as we go along. Uh, all right, so let's jump into it then. I'll just quickly go through the team itself. Now, if you watched the video over the weekend, which was kind of my appetizer, given that I couldn't be around, uh, I covered most of the games. I think really the only ones I hadn't were the Sunday games, uh, which I should get a reminder if I can go back in time to round five, uh, which was what the Geelong North game and the West Coast Richmond game, which tons of players um, that were relevant on Sunday, really, uh, especially from the North side. So... Uh, let me undo my trades for this week so we can see the team, how it was, and then talk through options. Oh, that's going to go slow. Yeah, I would have imagined that filming on, uh, or recording on a Wednesday rather than Sunday would be faster, but maybe, maybe not. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah. Um, uh, what, so we had the North Geelong game and so yeah, she's all huge. Uh, just can't be stopped. And Honestly, it's surprising with a 131 average that he's not D1, but Luke Ryan's gone crazy. I had a look at his kick-ins just before recording this. He's had 35 over five games. He's averaging seven kick-ins a game, and I think he's played on from 33 of those 35, which is just insane numbers and gives him a really nice floor, uh, but still having that ceiling on the intercept marking front, which is crazy. Uh, other North ones I hadn't covered off, uh, you had, yeah, McKercher who obviously got injured and I've had that on field as well. I'm sure many others did as well. Uh, look, there was always going to be some concern that he wouldn't make any more cash after this week, but I wanted to at least see the role him, him in that mid half forward role before making a judgment call this injury and then having to trade him out or risk losing a whole bunch of cash just sucks. And even just losing a whole bunch of cash this week's pretty rotten. Uh, Cherry, for anyone that owns him, did uh, really well, continues to be a great pick. Uh, once again, one of those ones I was on in the preseason and Grundy got me off, which is a shame uh, because, yeah, Gorn Cherry over uh, Gorn Grundy probably was the move to start the year. And then, um, yeah, Powell continues to look like he'll be, you know, top six uh, midfielder, or, uh, sorry, forward or thereabouts. Uh, second in CBAs behind uh, LDU and I think doing what he can each week. Fisher had a pretty good game. Uh, obviously, he suffers from not being Sheasel in that side because they like going out through him. And it's really frustrating watching them come out of defense because I think Fisher's at his best when he's running by, um, getting the ball and able to attack the ground uh, rather than doing the slower chip kick style, which they seem to be doing a fair bit. And when he's going past for the one two day and not giving it to him, they'll give it to Sheasel, but they won't give it to Fisher. And I know he's not as good as Sheasel, but seriously, North looked their best when they're injecting ball movement in. And they were doing stuff like ignoring Fisher and then kicking it to wherever Tom Stewart was floating around free, which was just insanity to me. Uh, but yep, there you have it. Uh, LDU owners, I know he had a his first super, uh, sorry uh, fantasy ton for the year because that's where I own him. Uh, how did he go from Supercoach perspective? 
Oh, just the 87. So disappointing. Oh, I'm so disappointed in this pick. Look, I think the only positive thing is they play the Hawks this week and that midfield is absolute car car. So if he can't put up numbers against them, then it's well and truly uh, signs that he is washed at least for this year or until he finds some form. Uh, on, on the north side, you had Jai Clark come in as the sub and I thought, look, even though he's the sub, he can beat his break even of 11 uh, and at least not lose any cash before we have to trade him on. Big laugh, that clearly wasn't the case. And the forward line, um, Dempsey really put up a somewhat disappointing score against North, all things considered. Saved it late because he did nothing for the half, but that wasn't particularly good. And then, uh, yeah, the final game of the round, we had West Coast upsetting Richmond, but I was not upset about what Elliot Yo did, my boy. Oh, this has ended up being such a good pick. 115 average over, what, his five games so far. He's up 83K and he's got a 14 break even. So... The reality is that um, for the mid-pricer that he was, or the value pick that he was, he's putting up top six defender numbers at the moment, and we'll just ride him until the wheels fall off, which is hopefully uh, later rather than sooner. If he manages to keep this up until the buy, I'd be ecstatic. It'd be well above my wildest expectations for the pick. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll just keep taking those wins the best we can. Uh, oh, and then we had Reed, who, I mean, I think I'd mentioned it from at least three weeks out that I was pretty hesitant to trade Reed, um, knowing that he had this Richmond game upcoming where I thought he'd put up a good score and it was always going to be difficult for me to trade away from him before then, even though it looked like he might've been plateauing in price and sure enough, he delivered. And I mean, um, it finally means he's got the money movement we were hoping for. So he's up now. Um, well, he had a 40, 45 K improvement for the week. He's up now 110 K on the year. And with a negative 18 break, even, you know, if he puts up, even I think a couple of decent scores over the next couple of weeks, he'll he'll well and truly hit that 150k mark. But speaking to um, Selby coach of Moreira's Magic this week, like you know, he was thinking of trading him in last week, thinking that just with how soft the forward line is, that he actually may end up being a, a close to a keeper or thereabouts, just because he's getting midfield time as a forward, and we don't have many of those this year. Now I think that's probably a bit ambitious in terms of where Reed is on the um, uh, you know potential picks, but. He does feel like, at least for now, he's been playing well enough that we can hopefully hold him uh, to be one of those last rookies on field type thing until we kind of figure out what we want to do with the forward line. Uh, and I think that was really um, it. That was most of the picks from that game. Like if you picked up uh, Shea Bolton, he obviously had a really good game uh, and he's going to be an interesting option for um, place to look at after the bye. Baker had another decent game and had his highest CBA minutes for the year which is um, maybe no surprise uh, given some of the injuries they had, but he's gone, I think, 140, 97, 93, I want to say, in his last three. So Baker has been putting up good numbers. And uh, you had Kane McAuliffe, I guess, as um, uh, the rookie who had, I want to say, 40% CBA, so got a little bit of extra midfield time. Uh, did some you know decent things contested, so he might be an option off the buy. Um, oh, he scored, what, 58. So he had... Sub first game, 58. Only a negative seven break even, but one that's there. And the other one, which people may talk about, is um, I'm not going to try and butcher his name, but I think it's Lafau, who uh, kind of like medium to tallish forward option for them and really was the standout in their forward line um, on the weekend, just gone. Uh, put up a 108, which, you know, it's against West Coast. So uh, I'm not going to be like thinking that there's many great scores to come. And you can see from his previous three games, like 49... Uh, I hate how this doesn't always look at it. 39, and I don't know. I should just look down. So 26, 39, 49, 108. So at least been building into it a little bit. Uh, he's got a negative 52 break even. So he's one that we could potentially look at off the buys as well. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like it's the type of pick that could make only like 50K more from here and then just completely plateau. So one that's going to be hard to, to get on. So is the rest of the games um, uh, from the weekend that was just gone. Um yeah, overall, like really good Sunday for me. Um, usually these Sundays uh, go against you, but the back line in the end, absolutely going insane with three 145 plus scores. Uh, and then, yeah, a 92 being my lowest and a 124 from the rookie. That's crazy. Um, my my two lowest scores for the week that counted ended up being Green and Bontempelli, which is just nuts. So yeah, yeah, wild week. Um all right, and then uh, looking forward to the week ahead uh, with trades. Um, I guess there's like three things, three categories here to talk about, which is you've got your rookies that have topped out in price. 
you've got um, your underperforming premiums and you've got those that are missing a week either through injury or suspension. And what do you do with each of these category of player? Now, I think in general, my priority here is still to trade out those that have topped out in price and move them on and try and upgrade around the other two categories. But if you can't do that, or you really want to move on one of those other guys, we'll talk through them in a second. The rookies that have topped out in price this week, I think are, are pretty easily like McKercher, Clark. And uh, if you're a Carroll owner like myself and you don't unfortunately have Sharp, which you would very much love to have, uh, especially into the, the West Coast matchup this week, uh, then those are probably the three ones that, that all look like they could potentially move on. Adams is getting close, but probably has another week with a break even of 40. Uh, there are some others, like I think if you've got Seth Campbell, now that he's on the buy, he's probably topped out as well, 34 break even. Um, you know, he's obviously had some good scores and I wouldn't be surprised if he, like if after a week's rest, that if he didn't start his cash gen again, that's very much possible. But I think he's also another one that you could potentially look at uh, getting out of this week. Dempsey might be one week away from um, plateauing too, now that he's got a 33 break even and some of those 80s have rolled out of his uh, uh, score history so if he doesn't put up a good score this week he could be um almost ready to go so uh the one i wouldn't trade is sanders definitely don't think sanders is a trade even though his break even's at 49 i think after the week that's been i would be very surprised if he was sub again especially with liver missing and in fact i anticipate he gets more cba in midfield time this week i don't think saints are particularly strong as a midfield so he's um one i'm pretty I want to keep and, and field, I, I think, for the most part. Um, and then maybe the only other one that you could um, talk about here is house, which I know some people will probably trade out just because they don't have some of these other options to move on or it works with their structure. I think at this point, I'd rather keep than trade. They're missing now both Salem and Bowie for the next three weeks, I think, at a minimum after the buy. So I think that's probably good things for Howes, to be honest. Um, so probably the type of player I'd rather keep than trade. Uh, he's got now the the really poor score, the 26 out of his price um, cycle. The 46 will go next. And they've got Tigers first game up, which I think probably is uh, good things for him. So, yeah, I think he is one that you could trade if you don't have anyone else just because he's on buy this week. And this is what I flagged when I traded him, uh, what, a week ago is even if he scores well and resets, which is what he's done, you're not making any money this week. You're not making any money on the buy. Uh, and then you've got to wait a another week or two for really for him to start making cash again. But I think you can definitely hold him. Uh, so yeah, underperforming rookies. This is the first group to trade from. Now, the second group I guess to consider is underperforming primos. And generally we say to hold these premiums. Um, your LDUs, your Dawsons are the two that come to mind to me, but we've had others that have dropped poor scores this week. Bont, Green, both examples of that. Um, you had English that dropped a poor score this week, Petrarca. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure there's others I can think of as well. So should you be trading any of these? And I think in general, the answer is no, because it doesn't take much for them to come back, uh, especially if the role is still there. And that's what we saw with Martin and Young, who I originally traded, I've got Martin back in. I wish I still had Young now as well. Uh, if if the roles there, things can turn. Um, where I think there is more consideration to trade is where the role isn't there anymore, or where it's shifted. And surprisingly, the one that sits at the top of this list is uh, Jordan Dawson. So he's lost 130k, which is crazy. It's insane. I, I wasn't um, big on him to start the year just because of Crouch coming back in. Uh, I think I was off him all, all preseason, basically. But yeah, definitely has affected him. And the last two games, they've shifted him forward with him kind of having like 45% forward time. Now, unfortunately, his first three games were in the midfield, so he's not going to get forward status. Otherwise, you could hold. Um, so I feel like this is the type of player that does make sense to trade. On the other side, they're playing Essen this week, which you can definitely score on as a midfielder, as long as you're not paired up on Durham. And honestly, Jordan Dawson may be the type to get the Durham matchup, which is a bit of a concern. But with Crouch out for the week, you'd imagine he's back in the midfield and they test the midfield mix basically that they had all of last year. With that said, Saligo, Rankin, both have looked good as being used as midfielders and injecting some of that pace in, and they won doing this um, last week, and Dawson was moved forward when they really like came back and got over the top in the end as well. So I think Dawson, as much as I generally say you hold these underperformers, 
is one that makes sense to trade. I know George, George, I think as of two weeks ago, was saying he'd trade him. And, you know, maybe that was a sign you listened to the Crows, man, that if he's out on Dawson, that you trade him. But if you're still holding and it makes sense for you to move him on, you can't do any upgrades. Otherwise, then, yeah, I think Dawson's probably a trade. But some of these other underperformers, I would definitely hold on to. Maybe the only other one that's worth um, flagging as a concern is English. And we'll look at the Dogs teams in a second, but they've now got Lob and Darcy in there along with him. I think this is a bit worrying that they uh, don't, like basically that he's not used as as a uh, with like 80% plus ruck contests, which is what he's been in the past. And they use him more forward or even half back, lol, what a meme. Um, uh, you know, it just feels like almost no one's safe in this uh, doggy side at the moment. So yeah, he's, um, his track record's been okay against um, uh, Marshall, but uh, Frio are generally not that easy to score against. So with like the Darcy... Jackson pairing and then Hawks have been restrictive in the past with Reeves, but I don't know with um, Meek in there whether that still is the case or not. So look, he's he ruck fixture isn't too bad, and if it was the English of old and the Dogs of old, I think I'd be fine with um, holding on to him. But this is the one that I'm like six fifty price tag, one ninety four break even. It kind of feels like it's now or never because even if he only tons, um, he loses forty five k. This week, which is a crazy man. He's sub 500k this week, uh, sub 600k this week. If he um pops another poor score, so if you do want to trade, I feel like it's now, now or never. Uh, but once you don't have to, um, and generally I like holding these underperformers and and figuring them out much later than now. But if you uh, had to go, then then those are the two I'd probably consider. And then the last group here is those that are on one week um time offs. So you've got. Tom Libertore, uh, who's, yeah, 624K, and you've got Matt Crouch. Now, of these two, um, I think Matt Crouch, you definitely... Uh, actually, sorry. Uh, all other things considered, these are always holds for me. A one-week injury, when it's best 22, I would hold. It's best 18. I'm, and most people are only missing one premium this week in gone or zero. So I would always hold these and just loophole some rookies and you'll be fine, right? That is my standard answer for this. Now, I think... So Libba, there's no way I trade. I think Matt Crouch is the one that I would consider trading just because I believe his mid-time reduced a little bit um, uh, with more Saligo and Rankin through there. And honestly, his score was saved a little bit just through playing really well in the fourth. He's only generated 45K, but he's, you know, averaged pretty well up until this point. I think this is the type of player that you could trade, especially once again, if you can't do any other upgrades or don't have any other issues, then moving on Matt Crouch this week, I think is fine. Um, and I'd be okay to do that. Oh, the only other one we haven't talked about is Luke Jackson. And I think like this one, I've really struggled to think or talk about because I don't own him. So I haven't, oh, I own him in Bolter, but I'm, I'm holding, I think, um, so it's a little bit like English where he was nearly 600K last week. He lost 36K. Um, it's, you know, once again, it kind of feels like now or never, um, but it's really hard because even though uh, like he's probably not going to make this break even 156, it's definitely possible. Uh, he's got Darcy back this week, but they're playing West Coast, which is the easiest matchup for Rucks and basically for forwards too. So even though he should be playing more forward, um, he should still score well and he will still get time in the ruck. They're going to manage Darcy, I imagine. And if West Coast get up really high early, I can imagine them either giving Darcy a lot of time resting forward uh, or just subbing him out altogether. Uh, so like Luke Jackson should score well. In general, I think this is like the type of player I probably just hold and wear the cash loss um, because even though you could get him back maybe cheaper, maybe sub 500, it's not like it's... 100k or 150k cheaper and he's going to be a top six forward so i don't like really spending a trade taking this person out and then bringing them back in knowing they'll be top six or thereabouts at the end of the year plus their good ruck cover so i think if you have jackson you hold him um yeah crouch i'd probably trade libba i definitely hold there's no way uh dawson i think you could look at trading english probably not but very tempting. And then almost all the other underperforming or poor scoring uh, primos, I would just hold. Uh, so I think I think that's um, most of it this week. In terms of trade-in targets, 
Just going through the lines, I think the best two in defense are probably uh, Dacos, if you don't own. Uh, like, I think he's break even still one that... Oh, that's 108. So he, he might be at his lowest point now for the year. Uh, look, Porter definitely harder to score against for sure. Uh, I think the harder side for mids, and they're not far off for defenders as well. So this might not be his best week. I can't imagine they tag him. Uh, he hasn't, to be to be honest, I don't think he's been worth tagging this year. I would rather send someone to Dagoe than Dacos. But we'll see what Port do. Uh, I can also understand if you want to wait a week on Dacos just because he looked pretty poor in the lead up to this. So you might want to eye test him and that's totally fine as well. I think the other one um, that you could definitely look at is Young. He is right up there in the thick of it. He's put three one ten plus games together, which is what he was doing at the end of last year. And uh, yeah, cleaned up some of the clangers. West Coast this week, Richmond in three uh, three games. And even dogs in the middle, which aren't too bad to score on as well. So pretty nice um, run for Hayden Young here. And I think he's going to be thereabouts when it comes to top six and at a very good price, 550. So yeah, Young at 550, Dacos at 566. I think if you're looking for a defender option, they're the two. I know some people will consider Yo, um, especially given he's got the low break even and he's pretty cheap. But if you didn't start him, it was because of injury risk. I think you just keep... Um, anti-podding him. I mean, it's not really like many of us own him. 14%, it's pretty low. I wonder if he's more owned than Young. Uh, so then Ryan, oh, like Ryan's 13%, Yo's 14%. That's pretty crazy. They're both like very pottish. Um, yeah, so I think you just, you know, continue to anti-pod him because of that injury risk. He's priced right up there now. And I think I'd rather, I'd probably bet on um, Dacos and Young outscoring Yo to the end of the year. So... Yeah, probably one that I'm not really looking at. Plus, from next week, we get Martin going back, if you, uh, Roberts going back as well. So, we're going to be able to fill up that defender line pretty easily. Uh, in the midfield for options this week, uh, yeah, a little bit trickier. I mean, I think Martin's probably still an okay buy. He actually led Essendon for kick ins this week, even though he had a poorer score. Definitely getting used up the ground more. We'll see how that plays out. Uh, against the Crows this week. Should be a good game. Should be a good game. I think it'll be close. We'll see. Uh, midfielder options. I think this is the hard one and probably the line that I'm least interested in buying this week just because a lot of the good options now are up in that 620, 630, 640 price range. Not really presenting good value. And we've just had some of them like Petrarca here drop a really poor score. So in two weeks, he's going to be cheap. Uh, in a couple of weeks, Bont's going to be quite cheap. In a couple of weeks, Green's going to be quite cheap. Um, so if you don't own these guys, that's what I'm kind of waiting for. I'm not really going on any of them now. If you absolutely had to go on someone, I don't mind Josh Dunkley as a bit of a point of difference. I think he's probably towards the bottom of his um, price range now. Uh, oh, I mean, like you, Goulden coming off the buy, I think you could definitely look there. Although from memory, he's had all of his soft fixture or most of it. Uh, I've still got Hawks to go in a couple of weeks, but you've got, you know, some of these harder teams then coming up. So I'm not sure how appealing that is. Uh, but yeah, this is, I think the hard part with the midfield is that there's not a lot of guys um, that are cheap and worthwhile buying. Now, people will definitely ask about Sam Walsh. who looked good coming back from game one and did that last year. He had to think a, a decent stretch where he looked all right. But these back issues are reoccurring and definitely not one that I'd be looking to jump on. Um, I, I'd want to see another week at least, see how he goes against a tougher matchup in West Coast before even considering him. So yeah, I'm, I'm off him and like he's value, but he's not extreme value. So I'm not really sure about that. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess the only other ones, like if you are looking to pay up, the players that have really good um, fixtures upcoming for me, like Merritt, even though he's probably the most expensive of these, he's got a nice fixture with, um, after the Adelaide, he's got Collingwood, West Coast, GWS is hard, but then North and Richmond. So there's like four or five games here that are just really nice. Uh, you could even buy him next week before the Collingwood game, I think, although Adelaide's been pretty easy for midfielders as well. So yeah, he's coming right into a really soft fixture. You've got, um, where is he? Oh, actually, he's he's. I think he's dropping in price a bit. Let's sort by average. So Caleb Sarong, one fifty five break even. Uh, but West Coast this week, so totally potential to hit it. Then Dogs, then Richmond. So those next three games are pretty nice. The fixture gets a little bit harder after that. But Saints and Collingwood after the Swans game means it's you know all okay. So that's uh, definitely another one you could look at. Uh, and there was a third one. I can't remember who the third one was. It had a fixture that I looked at that I liked to look at. I don't think it was Steel. 
I think if you don't have steel now, you just stay off. Even though he's looked amazing, he's had back-to-back -back 140s now. It's insane. Who was it? Oh, I think it might be some of the port guys. So maybe it's Butters that you look at. They have a, a decent fixture. So uh, yeah, Collingwood Saints, Adelaide, Geelong, Hawks, North is the next six is pretty good as well. So I think you could consider like a Butters. Um, I'm not as big of a fan on Rosie, but yeah, there, I think those are probably the three that I'd be looking at as ones that I'm pretty confident are top eight and have very good runs. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, they'd be my midfield targets, but you have to pay up for them. So I'm probably more in favor of waiting. Maybe if you're trading like a, a Dawson or something like that or a Crouch, you could afford one of them. In the rucks, if you're looking for a target this week for me, it's Marshall. Um, he hit his break even last week, so basically didn't move in price, but now has a 78 break even, so we'll start moving back up. And once again, um, a decent match uh, this week in the dogs. They are the third easiest for rucks or something like that. Um, it's a it's a pretty nice matchup, even though he hasn't got the best history on them. And in the forward line, if you don't have Heaney, I think I'd just stay off Heaney at this point. He did drop in CBAs with Adam's return, so I think I'd monitor for that. If you don't have Powell, I still think he's a good buy at 425, even though he's getting up there now. Uh, uh, Flanders is the one that I don't have, who I'm definitely looking at as an option this week. And then beyond that, I think you're... Um, You'd be having to look at like someone like Rankin who now leads Crow's CBAs, but you know, he kicked three goals for this 121 that he had last week, which wasn't amazing. Uh, at least like Essen and North and next two, so the matchups, the fixture's pretty nice here. But yeah, I think he's the one that you, if you wanted to go speculative, that's who you'd probably look at as a forward option. All right, going into the rookies, um, if you don't have Closey, that's an easy number one. Then uh, after that is Graham, who has taken, Will Graham here, who's taken the fourth midfield spot for Gold Coast, replacing Flanders. Uh, so he's getting 45-ish, 40%, 45% CBAs, and did a really good job tackling on the weekend, which I think will help secure his spot. And uh, then beyond Graham, it gets a little bit trickier for rookies because they're the two premium ones on the bubble. We do have a third kind of rookie on the bubble in Charlie Combin, who's nearly 230k. So negative 75 break even after a 129 and a 75, but very conscious of the fact that, that 129 drops off. And if he doesn't back up with the, another good score this week, then his cash gen can stagnate quite quickly. But I, I do think his job security is very good. I think he's kind of taken over as the number one key defender. And from what I saw on the weekend, he continues to do some great work with his intercept marking, a real highlight of his game. Uh, but we had someone else come in to the defense on the weekend, and that was uh, Biggie, who seemed to take some of the role that Combin had when it came to um, being involved in the switch kicks and the play across defense. So Combin's, I feel like Combin's usage in just general play went down a little bit, which does, I think, hurt him as a pick um, and does make me consider if I want to go pay 230k for Combin or uh, maybe go a little bit risky on one of the first gamers that we've got, knowing that there are a couple of options like McCaller, for example, coming off the buy next week. Uh, so, yeah, you've got Nguyen who... Um, um, Biggie Nguyen who, um, yeah, 124k. He had an 89 on the weekend and impressed, but the challenge with him is he came in for uh, what, Dawson and Dawson is... I want to say two to three weeks away. So there's a chance that we maybe just get one price rise out of Biggie. And if he hasn't done enough to hold his spot, then he gets dropped. But he had something like 20 touches on the weekend, did some defensive stuff. He had one real bad moment, which was a clanger kick in the, I want to say the fourth quarter, uh, where he hit basically Dempsey at the top of the <laughs> square for the easiest goal of Dempsey's career almost. So um, yeah, but otherwise he played well. Um, other first game rookies we've got is um, Drury who uh, I think had a really good first game last year and then faded off the back of that. <laughs> and I'm a bit worried that we saw the same thing here. Now, in looking at his game, he played pretty well. But to me, to my eye, it looked like he had almost Cam Zerha's role where he was 
standing on one of the wings at the top of the 50 and then running in from that at, uh, at CBAs to be like the first hit up kick out of the uh, like center stoppage or other stoppages, which he did a pretty good job of. And then he was kind of quickly turning and looking to hit up something in the corridor for like a um, short 45 meter, uh, sorry, short 45 degree, 15 to 20 meter kick. Hit Sheasel a handful of times doing that. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure about Drury because I feel like that role may not be his, especially if Zerha is back. And I actually really want Zerha to be back this week so I can see them together before making a decision on Drury. And the other rookie that played their first game, which I think is worth talking about uh, or flagging is Hugo Garcia. So came on as the sub in the third quarter for the Saints uh, with what Max King going off with his knee issue and was a real live wire. Lots of pressure acts. I think he had something like 14 or 16 or something like that. And to give you an idea, like Jack Steele led that midfield with 23 for the full game. So for him to have like 14 and a quarter and a half is huge. He tackled a heap. I think eight of his 11 touches were contested. So really he did a whole lot in that last quarter and a half. And that was when the Saints were competitive with GWS and got back into that game. And he also got a fair bit of praise from uh, Ross the Boss in the press, a kind of unprompted talking about Garcia. I think that's, you know, it's... I, what I've pointed out with Wilson before in the past, well, like that high work rate, I think like that pressure style, the work rate, that's what Ross loves. You know, the defensive um, actions that may not necessarily score points, but uh, loves in terms of his game plan and style. And I think that bodes well for Garcia and actually maybe a good uh, point in time to talk about the lineups because the, the lineups for the Thursday game has dropped and you've got Max King who will take a week off, but sounds like no major structural damage you know, should be back after that. And you've got Zach Jones coming in. Now, that, this is the interesting thing because Zach Jones is the midfielder or the type of midfielder that a Garcia would be competing with. So we'll see what happens, whether he's sub or not for this game. I My prediction is, maybe this is just my hope, is that Philippou gets moved out of the midfield time. He's kind of been getting about 30% CBA. So he gets moved back into the forward line because he hasn't really impressed as a mid this year. Garcia gets a go on the ball and Zach Jones is used as the sub. I think it's probably more likely that like Zach Jones goes into the game and Garcia is sub again, just given how well he played that role. But I'd hope that Ross gives Garcia another go because they have been giving the youth um, a shot this year. And on the dog side, why even bother analyzing what uh, Bevo is doing? Uh, I, I don't know if they're trolling us by having Riley Sanders named in their sub spot. And I guess it is actually worth talking about like if he's the sub tomorrow night, what do you do with him? Because I think he probably just becomes a priority must trade because he's not going to hit that 49 and Bevo's lost his marvels. Um, so yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, but the rest of this, this um, changes are also kind of interesting. So you've got Harms here who he's only played one or two games, but he's you got to remember he's 258K. He's actually very cheap. Uh, so he played one game for 35 and he got suspended and hasn't played since. He, he, he has another good game here. He is potentially an option in our forward line, which is crazy. Um, and where was I here? Uh, and then a uh, Eugle Hagen's out for personal reasons. So I assume he's back next week, but it's mean Lob is in the side. So two implications here. You've now got three kind of, uh, well, two relief rucks alongside English and Darcy actually named as the one, uh, no, no, no. So English is still named as the follower. So I got these, uh, Darcy and English confused here looking at those. Oh, what a concern. Um, so yeah, like interesting that you got these two re relief guys with English. And I wonder if Lob takes more of the ruck time than Darcy, for example, which could affect Darcy this week, uh, or if they both take some of English and English plays more forward this week. Uh, and that's why I was, you know, like, is he, do you, is he someone you consider for a trade? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but I think this could potentially hurt English this week. And then, yeah, Liver out. I would actually assume that Sanders plays a full game, but who knows what's happening with this bench, really. This is a bit scary. Matt, maybe right, Riley Garcia has to be the sub, right? Harms comes in for Baker. Lob for Eugel Hagen. Sanders into the midfield for Liber. Garcia the sub. I think that's how that makes sense in my mind, but Doggy Sands, correct me if you can read the mind of Bevo better than I can. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, um, that's kind of all the considerations. Uh, so my trades then and vice captain captain. So the ones that make sense for me to trade this week are definitely McKercher and I don't have Graham. So that is the easy, um, first trade for me. We'll just lock that in. 
Uh, and then uh, we can kind of play around with what we do from here. So I could just do nothing really else from this spot because I don't see Combin as necessarily a must have, although I, I don't dislike him as an option. Uh, or I could try and get in an upgrade this week and get to Flanders, which I think would definitely be preferable just given how good he's been. So I could get rid of Fisher. Oh, I could just get rid of Fisher for Flanders. Okay, that's interesting. I might do that. I might not use a boost this week and hope that Clark gets dropped. And so my other option here is like, I can move on one of Clark or Carol. And if I do that, um, I don't know if I'd use a boost for it. I did not even realize that that's a much better trade than what I had previously planned. So uh, Clark down to um, Biggie, I guess, is one option if Clark gets named because he's going to lose more cash. And I feel like if I don't trade him this week, I'm probably going to just be stuck with him in this M11 spot for the year. Uh, or if Carol is named like sub, I don't know if that's really going to work with um, how the fixture is this week. Hold on, let's have a look. Okay, Carlton plays before North, which is good. North is last game of the week. So I, what I could do is just with um, Carol and Clark, just wait and see what happens, especially um, Carol here. If he's named sub, I probably want to move him on uh, because his break even is 46. Um, so as a sub, he would definitely lose money. I think if he plays a full game, especially with Chera out again, he could hit that. But, you know, Chera was out last week and he was sub. So who, who's to say? And then, yeah, Clark here's break even 74. If he plays, even if he just plays, then that's a worry. So I could hold on to this um, trade and do nothing uh, and the boost and do nothing, which will come in handy later. But if I just want to save the cash gen, then I might have to look at moving either Carol for Combin or Biggie or Clark for Biggie this week. Let me know what you would do uh, below. But yeah, bringing in Flanders for Fisher. I don't think Fisher's a trade by any means. I don't think you have to trade him. But it i mean i've got to get flanders in he's along with heaney those are the two that you're most confident with are going to be top six forwards for the year and he continues to be good and he actually got kick-ins uh, as well for the first time last week which is pretty handy the only thing left really for me to discuss is vice captain captain this week and i i think this thursday game's got a couple well actually three really good options in marshall in steel and in bont steel is probably the one that i wouldn't um, originally have considered as much just because dogs have been harder against the mids and I uh, expect they'll bounce back. But with no uh, with no liver in there, I imagine Steel and Bont just go head to head unless they want to put in like a Windhager to put in defensive work on him. I either way, like I think this should be good for Steel and I expect Bont to bounce back, especially with no liver in the side. I think he had two games last year without him and one he went 160, the other I want to say it was like a 115. Um, so it was like, you know, neither here nor there. His history against the Saints, he's got some really big scores in here, 125, 181, and 159. And then Marshall's the other one. Even though his history isn't as good against the Dogs, he uh, is coming off, what, a couple of pretty big games now, 130s, 140. So any of Bont, Steele, and Marshall I'm considering as a vice captain this week on the Thursday... Uh, captain, I think, is a little bit harder for me. If you've got a Sarong, then I feel like a Sarong is a very easy captain. Uh, West Coast is actually quite easy for defenders, according to Supercoach Gold. So, like, I could look at someone like Ryan, but this feels risky because I don't think he's going to be... Like, if he doesn't get the intercept defense, uh, intercept points early, and this is the blowout, then scaling's going to work against him, even if he gets a bunch of junk late. So, that's a bit of a worry. Sheezel is another one you could consider as a captain, but I think there's a chance that Finn puts attention into him. Uh, so not, you know, particularly keen on that one. Um, definitely not looking at Dacos. Beyond that for me, you've got Butters against Collingwood. I don't know what his history is like, but I feel like that's a pretty decent matchup for mids, although um, the Pies are coming off the bye, so that might help them. Uh, Green, I wouldn't go into GWS, even though I think he probably bounces back. Uh, and then Heaney, I kind of mentioned that I'm a little bit worried about his scoring. So I, this is tougher for me. I think after this vice, I really I really got to nail this vice captain, I think, because I'm not super confident of any of Ryan, Sheasel or Butters as a captain. And that's really what I've got left if I miss it. So is Bont the safest of those? I'm not sure. Steele's got the best form. Let me know what you do uh, below, please. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching as always. I uh, hope you had a good week and yeah, peace.